And for the tutorial, we will cover some basic usage of ESPNet, including how to run uh, existing recipe and how to make a new recipe. We will use our uh, speech recognition as an example, but ESPNet uh, supports many different tasks and you can check them in the official document or in the GitHub repo. So here I listed uh, several major references here. This is our uh, GitHub repo. You can see some uh, introduction of the features here. And the, another one, the second one is the official documentation. So if you want to install ESPNet in a different environment, or if you want to change some configuration for the training, or you want to try some other uh, notebooks, you can find them here. I will uh, check some of them later. So for this tutorial, the overall objective is to get you familiar with ESPNet, especially how to use an existing recipe. And more importantly, you should know how to find the resources if you do encounter a specific issue with ESPNet. Okay, so let's start by the installation. Uh, ESPNet actually supports many different ways to install uh, this package. And here we will follow the Anaconda based one. So before that, we first uh, define a function here. So this function will print the current date and time. This is used to verify that your output is done within this class. So if you run this after the class, we will not accept it as the checkpoint. If you get a GPU backend, you can check its GPU type here. So by running this uh, command, we can see this is a Tesla T4 GPU. It has 16, around 16 GP memory. To install ESPNet, we, uh, we need to first download it. So we just use git clone to directly clone it from the source repo. This should just take a few seconds. And we also uh, check out to a specific commit to make sure uh, these results are reproducible. And also if you use some earlier commits, you may encounter some uh, problems with the installation, especially for the incompatible package version with number. So to avoid, uh, to avoid that, we can use uh, this commit. After downloading it, uh, we need to set up a Python environment to install all the toolkits and the ESPNet package. So you have multiple ways to set up a Python environment. You can do it using your system Python. You can create a virtual environment, or you can download an Anaconda and use Anaconda to manage your packages. And here we recommend uh, this Anaconda-based approach because it can organize the environments very well. It will not interfere with your other environments. And if you go to this uh, explorer, you can see the ESPNet repo here. So we are now working inside the tools folder. Uh, we are downloading the Anaconda, install it. And here we specify the environment to a uh, name to be ESPNet and the Python version to be 3.9. But ESPNet also supports other uh, different environments. Uh, it has some CI errors now, but overall it should work. And after setting up the environment, uh, we need to install uh, some necessary required toolkits and also install the ESPNet package itself. So this step will take a long time. You can start it. And here I just specify a particular version for CUDA and for the PyTorch. This is a relatively new version, but if you prefer, you can use some older ones or any other thing you like. Okay, is there any questions about this installation? I think it's pretty straightforward. It's just a click. Uh, 
something you and you it will start to install it. Okay, so uh, when it is installed, uh, the package we can check some other things, like we can introduce briefly introduce this repo. So if you go to the ESPNet repo, you will find many different directories. So uh, the recipes are stored in these two uh, folders. So this is for the original ESPNet one recipe. This is what we will use in this tutorial. It contains the recipes in ESPNet two. So if we go to this uh, directory, we will see many, many folders here. And each folder means a different data set. We use a data set name to specify a recipe. And some of the data uh, sets has multiple uh, tasks. Uh, for example, this AN4, it has supported ASR and TTS, but some others only support one. Like this one supports TTS, this supports ASR. So today we will go to this AN4 directory. We will use ASR1. And uh, all these folders share the same structure. So you will see many symbolic links. These are shared scripts. You don't need to uh, change it yourself. And we also post uh, some initial results that was trained uh, that was trained by others using ESPNet previously. So for this uh, data set, we have one experiment result from Transformer. And we can check uh, these are different decoding configs and there are results here. If you go to some other directories, you will see more comprehensive experiments. For example, let's check the libre speech one. So this libre speech contains around 1,000 hours of data. So it's a relatively large data set. And we usually use it to compare different methods. And in this one, we have many pre-trained models. Like uh, this is conformer RNN transducer. We have some self-supervised learning features based models. We also have some other models trained from scratch. Uh, this is a type of encoder. And this is another type of encoder. Yeah, so basically they, uh, we just use this structure to organize these experimental results. Okay, so this folder contains all the recipes. So if you want to check the code, then most of them are located here. But some of them are based on the previous version, so they may be uh, in another folder. Um, what did you say there is in the case? Uh, that is also a recipe folder for the initial ESPNet. We have ESPNet 1, ESPNet 2. Nobody uses that uh, you, you can still use it. Yeah, but in this tutorial, we will use uh, the second version, the more latest one. Yeah, that's a good question. So if you go to our official documentation, you will find something like uh, this is a brief introduction about ESPNet too. So it listed some differences from the previous version. Yeah, it is trainer free, it is CARDI free. Uh, it provides on-the-fly feature extraction, and it supports more features. Yeah. So if you are unsure which one to start with, we may recommend the second one, ESPNet too. Yeah. But if you have prior experience, you can try the first one. Yeah. Okay. Let's check. So. I think it will still take a few minutes. Then we can go to this official documentation. Yeah, so as I mentioned, in this tutorial, I will just show you an example of ASR recipe.
But if your project involves some other uh, some other tasks like TTS, speech enhancement, or speech uh, speech translation, etc., you can find more demos here. Yeah, these are collected from previous years. And about the general documentation, I think this one is important if you want to install ESPNet in a different environment. So basically to install ESPNet, you have to uh, first download it and then set up. Uh, Cardi is optional. So you, you need to set up a Python environment. And we can use Anaconda based one, which is used here. And we can use other methods to set up it. And finally, you, you just install it. And uh, so this installation step only installs the necessary toolkits, but uh, different recipes may require different dependencies. So if some recipes need another different toolkit, you can install the customized toolkit by a few single, uh, by a few lines of command. I will show you two examples uh, in this part. But we will need to wait for it to finish first. Okay, this is about the installation. So another important thing is how to change the configuration. So if you want to look into that, you can go to this documentation. I will also introduce some uh, basic usages in uh, this tutorial. But for more advanced ones, you can check this documentation. Yeah, it actually includes many uh, different features. So, do you mean use an existing task or doing a different task? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in yeah, so in this tutorial, I will uh, show you how to use ASR task later. Yeah, after we install this. But if you want to use a different task uh, in the next tutorial, another TA, Jatun will introduce that, how to design a new task. So from this uh, place, we can see many packages are already installed. Uh, it still takes a few minutes. Okay, is there any other questions? If somebody wants to contribute to the cost of free, oh. what we can set up with their money. Yeah, I will uh, introduce how to contribute to ESP and finally. So we also have some guidance here. Yeah. If you are familiar with this and you train a good model, then you can contribute.
Okay, so on my side, I have finished the installation. So at the end of the installation, it will show some uh, installed packages and some other optional packages. So here we do not install all the packages. We just install the required ones. And if you want to install other uh, toolkits, you can just run these commands. Uh, I will show these two examples. So S3PRL can be used to uh, use uh, self-supervised learning-based front ends. And the FailSeq, I think many of them are already familiar with it. So these two uh, toolkits are not used in this tutorial, but it may be helpful in your project. Okay, do you have any uh, issues with the installation? If there's no issue, then uh, this is the first checkpoint. So if you run this command, this cell, you will get some outputs here. And please uh, keep this part. Do not remove this. After you finish all the four checkpoints, you just print it as a PDF file and submit that to the Grayscope. Uh, so are you able to see the assignment on Grayscope? Okay, okay. So we have finished the installation. Uh, next, I will show you how to use an existing recipe. So currently ESPNet has supported many, many recipes, uh, which I just showed. So if you want to see the full list, you can go to that place. And here we, uh, due to the time limit, we will use a very small corpus uh, called AN4. This is uh, created and distributed by CMU. So, we have finished this part. Let's go to the recipe folder. So in this next, uh, in the next section, we will work inside this folder. Uh, in this folder, we can see some subfolders and some scripts, and these are. Uh, mostly shared across different data sets. The config folder is used to store the specific configuration files. You can store your training config, your inference config, and other configs here. Uh, these scripts, py scripts, steps, and utils are shared across different recipes. So basically, you may not need to change it. 
Uh, this one is used to specify the path of the downloaded data sets. And we will see how to use it later. This one, you uh, usually don't need to change it. Inside this one, you can uh, change the uh, change how you run it because ESPNet also supports some job schedulers. But here, we just run it inside uh, this uh, terminal. We don't use any job scheduler. And this is the overall entry point. So if you want to run an existing recipe, you can just check this one. You can always open this one first and check how to use it. This is also shared across different recipes. You don't need to change it. So maybe we can uh, share this example. This is a round shell file for AN4. And here you can see that it's uh, pretty simple. It's just a course, this shell script and specify some uh, arguments here. Like this is a language, this is the ASR configuration file. Uh, it is used for training, and this is used for inference. This is a language model config. This is for speed perturbation, which is a type of data augmentation. And we also need to specify the training set, the dev set, the test sets. Uh, this is used to build a dictionary, build the modeling units, like BPE character or verse. This is used to train a language model. And in this example, we actually do not use a language model because it takes some time to train it. And we also do not use this round shell because as you can see, it just calls this ASR shell and uh, it runs multiple stages. Here we will run it uh, stage by stage to better understand this entire procedure. Okay, so um, let's start with the first stage. So basically, if you want to run an experiment, you will need to do like three things. First is data preparation. You need to prepare the data and organize it in a proper form uh, so that you can efficiently load it during training. And then you, you will start the training. And after training, you need to decode your model on the test set and get the inference results. Finally, you can run the scoring script to get your uh, final results. Like for ASR, we will use word error rate, character error rate as the major uh, metrics. So here we will first run the data preparation stage. It contains uh, multiple stages we will explain what this means. So first stage is about, uh, it's called data preparation. It downloads the raw data, splits the entire set into uh, training set, validation set, and test set. And we also prepare them in the CARDI format. This is probably the most uh, difficult part if you are unfamiliar with speech. And this one is uh, task specific. So if you prepare a new recipe, you need to do this yourself. For this one, we just use this existing script. And uh, let's check this script. So in the ASR.shell, you will see uh, many different stages. And we have a number, we have an index for each stage. This is the first stage. This is the second stage, the third stage, and so on. So to specify the stage, uh, you will need to pass two arguments. This stage means the starting stage. So we start from the first stage. And this means the stop stage. We stop after we finish the first stage. And we specify the training set name, the validation set name, and the test set name. Uh, these names are actually created by the data preparation script. So if you check the data preparation, it calls another script here. 
and these names are decided by this. Okay, so if you have finished this first stage, you will uh, see a new folder called the data. Inside that, there are some subfolders, which are the splits. So th this is the training result dev. This is a dev set, and this is a test set. If you go to any of the folders, you will see some similar structures. We have four fi files here. And these files are the Cardi format. So we have a text, which I can show here. So each line is then uh, corresponds to an example. And this is the utterance ID for that example. This is a transcript. And this part pre prepares uh, the audio because we need to extract the audio from this specific format. But each line also corresponds to an example. And the first field means the utterance ID. The second field is uh, how to get the audio. And this means a speaker to utterance. So uh, speaker ID to all the utterance IDs. And this one is utterance ID to speaker ID. So utterance ID to the speaker ID. If you don't really care about the speaker, then you can use the same utterance ID uh, for the speaker ID of each utterance. Okay, so we have prepared the data. So from this one, we know the ground truth of each sample the transcript of each sample. And from this one, we know where well to fetch the data. Then we have both the audio and the transcript. Uh, so the data preparation is almost finished. But after that, we need to do some additional processing. Uh, so the second stage is about speed perturbation. This is one of the data augmentation methods supported in ESP.NET. And here we do not use it, so it will just Keep it. But in your own project, you may want to do some augmentation. And here we will, uh, for speed perturbation, we just change the speed of the audio. And we will store separate files for this augmented data. Uh, this is different from the on the fly data augmentation, like the spec augment, which, you, uh, which is also supported in ESP.NET. So after finishing this part, uh, we need a, another stage. So we will dump this prepared data into a specific format to more efficiently load them during training. And I copied the, some comments, some annotations from the script so you can understand what is this, uh, this script does. But generally, we are still doing data preparation. We do not do any training here. And after this stage, we will see another new folder called dump. These are all the dump features, including the transcripts and the uh, newly organized audio files. Yeah, basically they still follow the Cardi style. And uh, so one issue with speech modeling is that the input can have very different lenses. So in computer vision or in natural language processing, we can usually use a fixed sized input. But for speech, it is very difficult to do that. So, uh, even a few very long utterances can make your training very inefficient. So here we re remove some very long or very short data from the training and the dev set. Uh, but please know that we do not remove that from the test set. 
So actually, you will see that the same data set was prepared twice. So one for the real validation during training, the other for the inference after training. Okay, this part is straightforward. And the next part is to generate the token list. Here, it is pretty simple. We just use the characters as the modeling unit. So if you have finished this, um, we have arrived at the second checkpoint. Let's print out the generated tokens. So basically you can see each, uh, each line contains one separate token. There are some, there are three special tokens and the others are the characters. We have three special tokens here. This one is used for CDC modeling. This is for out of vocabulary words. This is for the encoder decoder modeling. We, we, we need to use a special token to mark the beginning and the end of a sentence. So is there any questions about the data preparation? You say you keep the text. Why do you still have to keep text? Oh, so we do not change the test set. Oh, so we do not have to uh, We don't need to process the test sets. Uh, we do not move the long short sequences from the test set. Yeah. We just uh, remove them from the training and the dev. Yeah. Yes, so you, uh, from this output, you can see uh, what he has done. So in this stage, we copied the data from this. This means the training set. We copied it and we uh, removed something from that. Okay. Okay, so I mean, in this part, we did two things. One is for the train, no dev set. The other is for the train, dev set. Okay, I think of this part uh, is finished. So after data preparation, we have an optional stage, which is the language model training. Uh, so if you want to use a language model for decoding, you will need to train it in this stage. But here we skip it to save some time. We will directly go to the main training part. So here we will train an end-to-end -end ASI model. If you are unfamiliar with these architectures, uh, they will be introduced in some later lectures, but here we just use it as an example. So ESPNet supports many different architectures, many different loss functions. Uh, we cannot introduce them uh, in detail here, but we will just use it. So here uh, we will train a small transformer model for this small data set. So please cre uh, create a training config file under the AN4, ASR, and configure folder. Let's create a file. I will give it a name. So this is only for this demo. 
we call it the train is a demo and the transformer. And then I have provided a training config here. You can just copy it. Okay, so after copy and paste, please save it. Once it is saved, we can use it for the later training stages. And I will briefly uh, introduce these different arguments during the training. So now let's just skip it. So for the ASR training, we have two separate stages. First stage is called ASR collect st uh, statistics. So here we collect some useful statistics from the prepared data. Uh, basically, we do two things. One is to collect the mean and the variance of these features. This will be used to normalize the data. And the other thing is that we need to collect the input and, uh, and output sequence lengths in order to efficiently form many batches. Let's just run it. And the side note is that ESPNet supports many different uh, mini batch types. So which are, list, uh, which are listed in the documentation. You can change it if you want. But in this example, we will, uh, we will just use a very simple one. So that is an error, but we just uh, rerun it. Yeah, I sometimes saw this error, and rerunning it can solve it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so after this stage, you will see another new folder, which is experiment and ASR status. So this contains all the collected information. And after that, we can state our tra uh, start our training. We can uh, load a TensorBot to monitor the training status. Uh, please first run this cell and then start training. If you first start training and run this, it will have to wait until this finishes. Okay, so we can see a blank TensorBot here. And then we just start the training. Once the training starts, we will notice another new experiment folder here. So all your training results are, are saved here. And you can specify a different name for this folder, but here we just use the default one. Okay, so when it is training, we can check the TensorBoard. If we go to the time series, uh, this is the training event. This is a validation event. And we have different statistics. If you want to automatically reload data, you can turn this on. And the minimum uh, interval is 30. You can adjust the smoothing for the different curves. 
and ignore the outliers so that you can see all the data. So during training, we usually monitor uh, some metrics. One metric is this accuracy. This is the average accuracy for different tokens because we are doing some sequence to sequence modeling. And we can check uh, like the overall loss. You can also see the learning rate curve. So here we use a learning rate scheduler. So you will see uh, the learning rate is changing. Actually, it will linearly increase and then exponentially decay. This training will take uh, around 12 minutes. So during training, I will explain this configuration. So this is our training configuration. It has several different, uh, you can call it the sections, but it's not required. We just organize it this way to make it clearer. So the first part, uh, we specify some uh, general configurations for the training. This is the batch fine method. Uh, as I mentioned, ESPNet supports many different batch types, and we specify one of them. If you want to learn more about that, you can just check this documentation. So I think it's very straightforward. And we specify the batch size. Uh, this is for gradient accumulation. Okay. Oh, can you refresh it? Please refresh. Okay. Okay. So, do you mean this one? Yeah. So, if if you ask for the right. Uh, so it depends on your to your token list. So, if you use characters as a modeling unit, then each input is a character. And the output is also a character prediction. And this accuracy is averaged across different time steps, also different samples. Yes, yes. Yeah. So during training, we usually do not do a, a, this final scoring. So we do not do a full inference and then check the final score. We just do it. Uh, step by step. Yeah, so the reason is that during inference, we usually do some beam search. Yeah, so that is uh, more complicated, more expensive. So we usually don't do that on training. And also during training, we can use teacher forcing. So we feed as a ground truth token and check the next prediction. But during inference, you do not have the ground truth. Okay, so if you check uh, the accuracy curve, it uh, gradually increases and the loss gradually decreases. So overall, the training is good. Okay, let's get back to the training configures. So here we specify the maximum uh, epoch. We trained for 100 epochs. But this may not be sufficient for the AM4 data set. Uh, this part specifies the initialization method. You can change it to other methods uh, if you want. This part specifies how we save the best models. So we save it according to the maximum accuracy. 
and we will also take the average of the 10 best models after uh, all the training finishes. And here to save time, I enabled uh, automatic mixed precision. And I also disabled uh, the attention port. So if you want to check the generated attention weights, you need to increase this part. So zero means not saving any attention port. And this is used for data loader. You can change the number of vectors. Encoder means the, just the encoder. We use a transformer. And these uh, configurations are specific to this transformer. The main dimension is 256. Uh, it has four attention heads. The linear intermediate dimension in the feed network is 1024. We repeat the same architecture 12 times. So it's a sequential model. It has 12 blocks. And we use some dropout uh, to every part. This is the same for the decoder. And here we use a joint CDC attention training. And we, uh, this is a multitask learning. So we have uh, attention-based decoder. We also have a CDC uh, added on top of the encoder. So this technique, I think it will be introduced in the lectures. And this is a label smoothing weight. We can use it to mitigate overfitting. And this part specifies the optimizer. We use Adam. And this is the peak learning rate. Remember that we have a learning rate scheduler. So this is the maximum learning rate. And this is the uh, warm up steps. So if you are familiar with transformer, uh, if you have ever heard about transformer, you may know that it uh, requires some warm up learning rate scheduler. Okay, I think it will still take like two minutes more. So let's go to the training log. So this training log will save uh, almost all the information about your training. So first it print uh, it prints out the command, the uh, all the arguments here. It prints out the vocabulary size, and we use the, the Xavier uh, initialization. So some parts are initialized according to that. And after initializing the model, it will print out the structure of the model. So our ASR model has a front end. Uh, this front end is used to extract the log mail filter bank features. This part is already covered in the previous lecture. So I think you are uh, familiar with it. This is a number of Fourier trans FFT points. This is a window length, the hop size, and some other configurations. Usually you do not need to change this. You may need to tune the hop length a little bit, depending on your application. And after extracting the features, we will normalize the data using the collected stats from the previous stage. So we specify the stats file here. But another option is to use utterance level mean variance normalization so that you do not need to collect the stats. This is very helpful if you use a self-supervised learning feature. You can find some examples in other recipes like libre speech. But here we do not use that. And the next part is about encoder. So we have a transformer encoder. It has several convolution layers at the beginning. Uh, so this will downsample the original input. So you can adjust the downsampling ratio by uh, specifying this module. ESPNet supports uh, some different settings for this. And this is a 
sequential for 12 encoded layers from 0 to 11. So it's 12. And then we have this decoder, which is similar to the previous one. For the loss part, we have this label smoothing loss for the attention based encoder decoder modeling. And we have a CDC loss. And these two are jointly trained. So it will also show you the uh, learnable, trainable parameters. This model is very small here. And if you want to compare some different approaches, uh, you usually need to keep this same or similar. And it also brings out the add-on optimizer, the learning rate scheduler, and also the form, the mini batches. So this one is for the uh, training set. Because we just specify the batch size to be 64. So this one is pretty simple. But if you use some more advanced uh, adaptive batchifying method, this number can vary across different batches. And in the training, uh, in the initial stage, you can see some uh, infinite or invalid grade gradients. This is mainly due to the automatic mix precision. But after the first stage, everything looks normal. And you just see some uh, training loss, et cetera. Okay, I think the training has finished it. So if you have finished the training, uh, we will arrive at the checkpoint three. In this part, you just print the training log. Okay, is this part clear to everyone? If your training has not finished, you can just let it go. And uh, after that, you print this log and keep it. Okay, so next part is decoding. To decode a trained model, uh, we need to specify some additional uh, arguments. If you use language model, you need to set this to be true. But here we do not use it, so we disable it. And we also specify the ASI experiment to be this name, this path. And uh, you can change the number of parallel jobs used for decoding. And ESPNet also supports uh, both GPU decoding and CPU decoding. Uh, here, I use GPU decoding. And since we only have one GPU, so this part will be one. And you can change the inference config, uh, which is similar to the training config. And here, I just run a simple decoding example with the uh, almost the default config. So once the decoding starts, you will see another folder under the experiment folder. This contains all the information about your inference job. For example, you can check this inference log which again prints all the, uh, collects all the necessary information. Like uh, this is the decoder architecture. And then it prints out uh, the information for each decoding sample. For example, this sample has this lens. This is the original input lens. And this is the final scores for the two paths. This is the best hypothesis. It is a yes.
Okay, I think this part is uh, easy to understand. But you can change different configs based on your uh, user case. This will take like three minutes with a single GPU. Uh, it means real time factor. So it's based on the decoding time. Yeah. And for each test set, it will generate a subfolder and all the information are stored inside that. This is a lot of files. And this is a score for each hypothesis, generated hypothesis. This is the final text. Uh, it has the same architecture as your training, uh, as what we did during data preparation, but this is for the different uh, inference. Okay, so after the inference, we will need to compare the generated hypothesis with the ground truth transcript. So we just need to run the scoring script. So you can see some results are printed here. And this part is about the overall results. But if you want to check uh, the detailed errors, you need to go to these folders, any of these folders. This is for word error rate, token error rate, character error rate. This is a hypothesis. This is a ground truth. And this is a scoring output. So uh, in this file, you can see that this is organized by different speakers, but we can check uh, the overall result here. This is a number of sentences, number of words, the correct rate, uh, the substitution error rate, deletion, insertion, and the overall error rate. And this is the sentence error rate. So we can see that uh, I think this is word error rate, is this one. And you can also see the alignments of different utterances. So we contain all the alignments information here. This is a reference, this is your hypothesis. This is deletion, this is insertion, this is a substitution. And sometimes you, uh, they are the same, so there's no error. Okay, so here we can see the last checkpoint. You just print out this results. Okay, so if you have finished all these four checkpoints, you can now print this entire notebook and submit it to Grayscale. This contains four points. Uh, overall, we have five points. So we have two additional exercises. You can finish that after this tutorial. Actually, in total is six because one additional bonus. Okay, since we do not have much time, I will quickly introduce the remaining content, which is mainly related to your exercises. 
So first, how to train user configs? This includes many two parts, the training config and the inference config. So there are two ways. One is config file based. We create a uh, training config and specify it in your command line. You can find the various examples in our uh, prepared recipes. And the other approach is the command line based. You can specify a specific config as an argument passed to the command. So this one has a higher priority. It will overwrite your uh, configs inside the file. And this is very convenient if you only want to change a few uh, configs. For some more advanced usage, please check this documentation. Okay, so we can see this is uh, the first exercise. It corresponds to the bonus, but actually the total number is six. So, uh, and it, for, uh, you can submit these exercises after the class and you can run it again. Yeah, just before the de deadline. We will release the second assignment on Grayscope, yeah. So ideally you should finish this before our Wednesday's tutorial so that it will be easier. But for the first exercise, uh, we will basically just use the AM4 data set and change the uh, training config in order to reach a better character error rate. So here I provide one example with branch form. This is another type of encoder. And I already trained it and get a result here. I recommend you start with this config and tune some other training configs. If you can get a better number than this one, you will get this bonus. Uh, this is not difficult. Uh, there are some very simple ways to improve it. For example, you can tune the, you can increase the total number of apples and you can, <laughs> so it is pretty simple. But one caveat is that this data set is very small. So the result can be unstable, even using the same config. If you just change the random seed, you may get some improvement. Okay, so due to time limit, I will not show how to train this model. It's just uh, the same procedure. If you finish this, uh, if you create a new training config, uh, you can run it from the stage 10 to stage 13 and show the results. And I already trained one before the tutorial. So this is my previous result. And you can see that uh, this is our previous transformer and this is a new branch formal result. Uh, th these are on the validation set. And I only changed the encoder architecture. Uh, all the other training configs are the same. And this model is actually slightly larger than the transformer one. It's around the 15 million parameters and the previous one is around 14. The uh, final part is how to make a new recipe. This is another exercise. We have prepared some detailed instructions in the official repo. So this will introduce more details on what you should do to create a copy style data. And I also prepared a subset of another small data set for the TGs, uh, TI digits here. You will use this part to train a new model. And it is also very small, so you can easily finish it uh, within like 20 minutes of training. Uh, I also showed the step-by-step -step 
instructions on how to create a new recipe. So first you need to create a new folder under this folder, under these paths. And you can just record this uh, script so that it will prepare some other required uh, files and scripts. And after that, you need to download the data. I shared it using Google Drive. So you can download it uh, by just one line of code here. This should be very fast. Yes, just a few seconds. And this is our newly created recipe. You will see the downloaded data. The, this is a compressed, this is the unzipped one. And we specify the path to the script. And the next part is that you need to prepare the data. Uh, basically, you need to prepare one script here, but this script can call some other scripts. So here, it calls another Python script. And this local data.shell is already finished. So you just need to create it and copy this into that. The Python script is also almost finished, but I left uh, a few lines here. So you need to write the remaining files. I think the file would be text and the uh, other to speak. So just the two lines of code here. You create it and you copy, paste it, and finish it. Finally, you, uh, we just create an entry point called the round shell, which has a very similar, a very simple architecture, uh, structure here. And I have uh, modified some of the configs, like the inference config is passed in the command line. And you can just use this one. You don't need to change it. And for the training config, you, you can also just use the previous branch owner one. Just copy it and copy and paste it. And finally, repeat the training and decode it. I showed one example. Uh, so you can see that the accuracy is already very high. And the performance is uh, actually very good. So similarly, you print out the results. Okay, so this is the second exercise. So all you need to do is to follow these steps and finish two lines of code in the data prep Python script. At the end of the tutorial, I also showed some more advanced uh, topics. Uh, I just share some additional resources. The first is how to fine tune a pre training model. So, if you have a new data set which is very small, you may want to load some, uh, load your model with from a pre trained model. So, this is supported in VSBNet, and you can enable it uh, by just passing a few arguments. And there is a very good tutorial here showing how to do this fine tuning. Another very helpful feature is to use a pre-trained, a self-supervised pre-trained model to extract the acoustic features. So previously we mentioned that we just use the log mail filter banks. Uh, but if you have a very low resource data set, this one can give you much better performance because these models are pre-trained on huge amounts of unlabeled data. So it can learn very strong representations. And finally, if you want to contribute to ESPNet, we have uh, uh, some detailed guidance here. 
depending on what you want to contribute, you can do take different actions. For example, if you create a new recipe on a new data set and you want to contribute, then you just follow this path. You can upload a pre-trained model to Hugging Face uh, following some of these steps. And we also have some checklists uh, for you to check before make a, uh, before making a pull request. And if you go to the ESPNet repo, you can see many pull requests. Yeah, you can also check some of the examples here. Yeah. 